Hi, I'm Mark Bender. I'm the Western Director of Sales for Bogan Imaging, and today I'm going to go over many of the products that we have for the videographer. This is the Avenger C1575B Super Clamp. This is one of the most versatile clamps, almost like a Swiss Army knife, for your production bag. It literally allows you to attach lights to unusual places. You can even attach small cameras. You can use it for car mounts, etc. Very, very strong, very reliable, very simple to use. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize about the Avenger version of the Super Clamp is that it has a metal T-handle. This is great because if you've got some real heavy loads and you have to apply uh, torque pressure with a pliers or a pipe wrench, you've got a good secure handle in, uh, to grip hold of. Another feature of the uh, Avenger uh, uh, Super Clamp is that we have what's called the wedgie. A lot of people don't realize what the wedgie does. Obviously it stores right here, but when you need to mount your super clamp on something other than a round surface, you turn this so that the V is down below. You take your wedge and you stick it right into the two holes. And at this point, I now have a flat compression surface so I can put it on tables, two by fours, any flat convenient surface and then I can go from there and use the hex mount system with all the accessories. One of the things that distinguishes the, the Avenger C1575B Super Clamp from anything else on the marketplace are a couple of safety features that have been integral to the Avenger Super Clamp since its early beginnings. The first thing is, is you'll notice that inside here, we actually use a brass nut to distribute the loads that are put on the tightening chassis. The nut really keeps it safe forever. Another thing you'll notice on every Avenger Super Clamp is there's actually a safety rating that is stamped right on the Super Clamp itself that is given to us by the European version of OSHA, which is called TUVA. And uh, they have very strict requirements. That safety rating, of course, is, is way below the actual capacity of the clamp. So you, again, you have a very safe, versatile mounting system. One of the over 70 accessories that goes into the Avenger C1575B Super Clamp is the 2906 J-Hook, okay? This is great because we can actually mount background poles, cross poles very readily into the J-hook. And you'll notice there's a funny little hole at the bottom of the J. What that does is we can actually tap into our crossbar and keep it from turning if we have to. Adjust your little T-handle right like that until it's tight and you're ready to go. This is called the uh, Avenger D210 snap-in grip head and it literally can take a regular stand or uh, you can attach another grip arm to another C stand and you merely snap it in and you bolt it down and then you have another grip head that you can put a grip arm or other support device and you're all set. This is another item of Avenger accessory that's right out of my, my grip bag. Um, this is called the F1000 uh, Baby Swivel Arm Suction Cup. And these are great. They're used to mount cameras, to mount small lights on, in, on a glass smooth surface. Uh, they're great in an office building where you've got a, a window in a small office. You can actually apply these to the surface of the glass and then mount your light and you still can articulate your light to get the angle you want. This is the Avenger D200 two and a half inch grip head. Uh, there's several innovative features in our grip head. The first thing is you'll notice that if you look down the locking barrel of this unique shape, this little angle here, this little V, as you compress with your T-knob, 
it actually locks on to the top of your C-stand very, very, very securely. Also, which is kind of nice, you'll notice we do not tap into the casting. There's actually a steel helicoid insert so that we can screw in and lock down as tight as we want and we will not cross thread our uh, casting whatsoever. You'll notice on the D200 grip head there are two lock off receptacles built into the casting. This is to accommodate various different manufacturers from all over the world, United States, uh, Germany, uh, Brazil, wherever stands are made today. Um, this will ensures that your equipment, all your Avenger equipment, will be compatible with anybody else's manufactured grip equipment. The heart of the D200 grip head, of course, is the locking mechanism that holds your grip uh, arm or other gobos or whatnot. We have a locking mechanism that's rather unique, and it's multifaceted. The first thing is, I don't know if you can see, can you see down this beige surface that's in here where my finger is? Mm -hmm. This is a brake material from the German automotive <laughs> industry. It's actually a brake pad. We call it, we don't know if it actually goes on Mercedes, but it is a German brake, automotive brake pad. You'll also notice that everything's smooth. What we've determined, and, and of course everybody's familiar with, tearing up the old rubber and cork gaskets. By having this smooth, of course, we eliminate that problem. The very principle of the brake pad surface is the more pressure that's put onto the brake, the stronger it is. So we apply the pressure with our moving big knob here, and it gives us literally one of the strongest uh, brakes in the industry. The next thing we do with the grip arm locking mechanism is you'll notice that our holes are elliptical. They're not round and they're not square. The reason is the square holes, all they do is they cut into your grip arm and eventually you just have a shredded grip arm. Uh, and it doesn't really increase gripping potential. The ellipse actually is the proper engineered way to lock onto a round surface. So you'll see all of the grip, head, grip holes in the head are elliptical so that you can get uh, a real, real good lock without damaging your equipment. The next locking mechanism incorporated into the D200 grip head is this ball bearing race. And what this enables us to do is you can tighten to tremendous pressures using the ergonomic rubber grip, which is really comfortable. You grab on here, tighten this all you want. Now, when you are done and you're ready to wrap for the day and you're tired and you've got 40 C stands to put away, as we all have done from time to time, instead of this being a struggle, it is really easy to release. And it really makes a, 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 a nice touch so that you have a positive lock when you need it and a quick release and an easy release when you're ready to wrap. Many people don't know what to do with a turtle bay C-stand. A turtle bay C-stand refers to the three legs as a sub-assembly of the entire C-stand. And what it does is it allows you to actually take the risers out of the C-stand and replace them with either shorter risers, longer risers, or other accessories. What I like to do is I like to take my base and I like to take this junior to baby swivel we make and uh, I've taken the, the, the uh, T-handle off of this one already because this has a female uh, 5 8 adapter on it so you can put it on a baby uh, stand as well as insert it into a junior. So what we're doing is I've taken that out and I'm going to now insert this into my C-stand and look what I've created. This is perfect for a low background stand, uh, anything like that. One of the things I like about this particular unit is that it lets me articulate the light itself or even a camera if you had to mount a camera in some you know, low angle. You can articulate this and your camera light can go to any angle and yet you're out of the way of the camera. You can put this behind a subject. Behind, uh, behind a table, whatever, you can hide it very readily. There's been a new advance for uh, DV and HD 
uh, productions, basically because the sensors are, have such high fidelity that they can pick up subtle differences of color that in the old technology and cameras, perhaps they, they weren't as discriminant, but today it is full-blown, uh, uh, very subtle, uh, can capture all the tones in your scene. So you have to keep a couple of things aware uh, when you use filters. And one of those things is you really have got to start with very clear optical glass. And I'd like to show you, I'm going to shove this format filter up into an old motion picture, up against an old motion picture clear filter. Um, this is the clear portion of this grad here. And because format uses B270 shot water white optical glass, uh, we don't introduce the artifacts in contrast, uh, uh, focus shifting and whatnot that the uh, what we used to call the soda lime green glass introduces in any of our high-end video productions. In fact, this is the very glass that lens manufacturers use to manufacture their lenses. What Format does to ensure the flatness of their glass is they actually manufacture the glass and what we call lath it, polish it, using a laser device that looks across the surface of the glass itself they polish it and one of the things that's very great uh, about the format flatness is they don't just say it, they actually give you the birth certificate of your filter with the recording of the flatness right here on this printout. This comes with every, every single format filter. What this is, this is a, a, a pseudo color reproduction of the surface of this particular filter. And the interesting thing about that flatness is format never shifts a filter unless its evenness is to within two wavelengths of light. The best old-fashioned motion picture glass out there is about five wavelengths of flatness. Well, the trouble is your HD chips, your HDV chips, uh, they can see to four wavelengths. So if you are uh, having that kind of wave problem, you can easily get rid of it by using the proper filter uh, material and format m ensures that we do have a flat surface in front of your lens. Um, you'll notice this diagram is really kind of cool. Um, you can see there's an x-axis here and a y-axis and it says x-axis slash pixels. And what that actually is, this is a pixel count. This is how tiny an area this is and how, how careful they are. This is a pixel count area of, an, you know, of the glass. And what this is, is this is the actual nanometer wavelength uh, uh, scale here. So you can see down in this area of the filter, there was less than 0.12 of a wavelength. And up here, and that's, that's below the surface. Zero you know, is, is neutral. That's below the surface, and up here is 0.16. So you can see how most of the filter surface is in this bluish green area, with just a few little areas in this 0.12 or 0.16 area. So it's it's actually kind of like a topo map of the surface of this fil uh, of the filter. It's very interesting. I'd like to start here a little discussion on grad filters for DV and HDV. Um, what is important when we go to our new cameras is due to the increase of depth of field with the short focal lengths of the cameras we use that sometimes in the old-fashioned graduated filters you actually saw the bands of increased density material uh, on the grad filter. So you tend to get this banding effect and even though that's relatively close to your lens, the depth of field that we have today with short focal length lenses, this is an issue. Well, what format has done, because literally the color is made at the moment the filter is made, and it is applied using a computer controlled process, the uh, changes in density are truly linear. They are seamless. You don't see the bands. So you can start what we call what we call the ramp or change in, in density. You start here, for instance, in the very clear area, 
and then about mid through the density starts to increase all the way to the stated maximum density of this particular filter. This particular filter happens to go to a max of 0.6, which is two stops. But again, it is a true attenuated or seamless grad. And of course, in our colors, we do the same thing. This is not a grad. Many people mistake that. This is actually a filter you would use to simulate a, a sunset on a cloudy day. So it, it, when you put it in front of your, your lens, you get this, uh, if you look very closely, there's kind of an area right here that's going to look like the horizon where the sun has just dropped below the horizon when you, when you put it on your camera and then you've got the uh, orange sky here. So these differences are subtle. Um, with format, what's lovely is, number one, because the color is made at the moment the filter is produced, if you should happen to break one, and especially when you're dealing with neutral density sets and you want consistency, if you break one and you order a new one, your color is going to match perfectly from your previous filter. So uh, you'll never have inconsistencies if you have two sets and one for your, your uh, second unit camera group or whatever. You can interchange and you will never see any differences, which is a real lovely convenience let alone uh, an important consistency feature. I want to direct your attention to make sure that you get one of these practical guides uh, that we make to using filters. This is the Format Filter Practical Guide. And it is a DVD that is actual video that has over 47 examples of different filter effects. So it's a very good kind of swatch book that a DP should become familiar with. The second thing is, is that on here are some very important educational things. Uh, one of them is uh, an interview with Mr. Roy Wagner on the use of our new soft effects filters on, the, on a uh, very popular television show. And then also uh, uh, Art Smith, who is working uh, for the National Geographic, uh, and some other scientific uh, agencies actually up in the Arctic doing a visual inventory of the environment. Inside um, you'll see the various filters, the filter effects actually listed uh, in order. We have a version that's shot in 24p also and in HDV. We also, the same effect, we just duplicate it with a different camera and unlike anyone else's similar material in industry, this is actually shot on video. And we tell you the camera and camera settings of each effect so that you can really evaluate the actual video end results. And leading, leading the technological breakthroughs again, Format has just introduced a new type of filter that we call soft gold. We make them in several different grades, and we start off with a uh, subtle effect, which you can see here. This is our soft gold number one. It actually uses a different technology to change the color balance of the scene. There are actually little platelets that are embedded in between the glass at a special angle, and they're actually changing color using refraction rather than uh, pigmentation. It also has the wonderful effect that it does enhance skin tones, but it does not give you that overbearing wash to your whole scene. It's really been met with acclaim throughout the industry. The next uh, version of this you can see is a much more uh, heavier effect. This is called a super soft gold, and this is our number three. The previous one, of course, was a number one. Much, much deeper in color. You can see a little bit of the gold when I, I, I change the angle, perhaps, here. And it also has a optical pattern that has these little dimples. These little dimples are from our soft effects filters, which, of course, have been the, uh, a big breakthrough because they're actually designed for the sensor sizes that we use today and not the full frame 35 millimeter. And they're in a random scattering so you don't get a moray pattern. Anyway, th we've combined all those technologies now, the, the platelet, what we, what we like to call the platelet uh, color correction uh, method and our soft effects uh, uh, little lenslets so that you get 
a wonderful effect without introducing some strange artifacts. One nice additional feature to the format line, just kind of a quality thing and, and an appreciation for the customer, every filter comes with one of these special microfiber polishing cloths, cleaning cloths, and it actually, when you open up your filter, and I'm here, I'm simulating putting it away, it actually comes to you wrapped in the filter itself. I've taken, this is mine of course, it actually has a quality control seal, so you even know it's kind of factory sealed when you get it, but it's just kind of a nice thing. You can keep the filter in it, it keeps the dirt and dust off, and then you can actually use it to you know, clean a smudge or whatever because it is a microfiber surface. Another thing we've done to ensure that you always put the right side of the microfiber uh, cloth against the glass is we've put, printed the label on one side so you always know that this is the side you want your your filter to go into and it's always clean. Something that a lot of people forget is the use of a matte box with our HDV DV cameras. One of the things that a matte box does is yes it holds filters but more importantly the front part of the matte box really is what does your work for you. It eliminates stray light from coming in at inappropriate angles so that we reduce flare, our color and resolution are kept natural, and also the native saturation is rendered in the way it was designed by the manufacturer. So if you want more professional looking, sharper images, I really recommend the use of a matte box. On the format Mac box, which is what you see here, we've also added what we call a French flag. And what this does is it keeps the overhead light, especially the type of overhead light that we run into in the fluorescent lit offices. It really knocks that overhead light out and that is a big flare and spill factor when we're shooting in the field. The French flag on the format map box is really indispensable when to shoot interviews under fluorescent lighting in office buildings. The fluorescent light coming from above, uh, really if we don't have a French flag, we can spill into your lens, cause a lot of flares, reduce the saturation of your image, introduce false color, and so the introduction of a French flag is really essential for shooting under fluorescent lights. In addition to the French flag, the format matte box also has something we call a sunshade. And this flange of metal is very important when we go outside because we want to prevent the sun's rays from flaring or reflecting off our, off our filters that we've inserted into our matte box. Another use of a matte box is we use it to hold our filters. I'm going to insert this filter into the rear uh, spring-loaded area, that what we call the stage. And on the format map box, that stage actually rotates so that we can create a different position for our grad lines and uh, we can also adjust for our polarizer filters. We also have one additional slot that you can put an additional filter on and th thus we call it stacking the filters for various effects. The three components we need to shoot with our reflect media is a power supply, our dimmer pack, and our LED light ring. So now all that's left to do is to take my power supply, plug it in to my AC source, turn on my uh, dimmer pack, and now you'll see the dimmer uh, values are illuminated. And as I turn this up and down, it's dimming and controlling the attenuation of the light output from the LED. The fourth component of our Reflect Media Chroma Key is Chromat. Chromat is a very interesting material in that it has uh, 70,000 micro reflective beads incorporated into the fabric in every square inch. And in doing that, I can actually wrinkle or curve the fabric, drape the fabric around objects, and I still get lots of uh, chroma key color returned to the camera. But the other advantage is that although it has a very high return to the lens of the camera itself, or actually our, 
our light ring because it re returns the reflectance actually upon its source and thus I can actually turn the green light, in this case a green ring light, onto the fabric and you won't see it until you are on axis to the light ring itself. You can also see that unless your chroma key color being emanated from the light ring itself actually strikes a piece of chromat, you will not get any uh, obnoxious spill, any mis miscoloring of your subject or talent. It is only reflected by the magic of the chromat material. The Ultimate DV we bring in to our chroma key set when we need to create what will be the live mix of our background and foreground. This is extremely important when you have clients who need to see how the final mix will look, although when you're actually doing the shooting, all that's in the background is your chroma key color. This way, they can really see the effect before you take it into editing. Also, for those of you that are doing live events where you want the mix to be live, then of course you can bring in your Ultimate DV. Uh, it will accept your signal from your HDV camera, however its output is going to be a DV output, which in the case of various venues can actually be an advantage because you can go and find DV uh, uh, devices for projection and, and monitors and stuff, sometimes in hotels and other unprofessional environments, uh, very, very readily. As you can see, the Ultimat DV has a very slim design. It's designed to be rack mounted if necessary, like in a flight pack. Very, very robustly made. It has uh, various controls on the front that help you actually clean up your image before you send it off to post. A lot of people uh, will let the Ultimat DV set the various levels, which you yourself can control uh, in a real time environment you can actually get those levels set, then start shooting, take that image, and then go to your NLE or whatever and process it later. The Ultimate DV also has various inputs and outputs which make it extremely versatile. These are located on the back. We have our AC input, of course. Um, you'll notice that here uh, on your outputs, you can output to an S video or a conventional composite video. Our input side has both S video, also your composite video. And the uh, same thing over here on what we call our foreground or camera side, S video or uh, composite video. We also have this two-way device, which is kind of interesting. This is your DV and your firewire. It has actually an input or output function. However, we do not recommend it uh, as an input device. As an output device, it's fine uh, because of the compression of DV. Also up here, you'll notice that we have the PAL and NTSC settings, so it's truly a international application unit. Some of the other components that you'll see here are basically used for programming the unit with factory updates and uh, that type of software uh, manipulation. At this point, I'd like to remind all the people that are interested in doing proper chroma key photography is that we want to give our set, give our camera equipment, give our keyer all the best information and the cleanest information we can. Due to the fact that when we do chroma key, the decision as to what is foreground or background is based on color we want to eliminate all artifacts as to color in our scene. To do this, I recommend an old-fashioned technique many of us are frustrated with and don't understand really why. And that is, we must white balance our scene, our camera to our scene's lighting. One of the things I recommend is this Last Light Easy Balance. This is available in several sizes. Here's the small one, which is a 12-inch. They also make a 20 and a 30 inch. Again, I want you to insert this at the plane of the subject, white balance your camera on the surface, and then you can start bringing in your other effects. 
If you don't do this, you have the chance of introducing various color anomalies and your edges to your image between foreground and background will not be pure. The last delight, Easy Balance, is made out of a special RGB 247 white balanced material for digital. The vinyl is washable, so if you get it dirty, you can just wipe it off with a sponge. And of course, as I showed you, it's very flexible. It folds into a pouch. On the other side of the Easy Balance is a digi gray, 18% gray surface. It's so neutral that you can actually take a picker during your editing process and see your RGB uh, values extremely perfectly even. We use this also for exposure determination uh, because being the perfect 18% gray, we can use it to set our IRE values, etc., for the exposure values with our cameras. Another versatile aspect of Reflect Media's chroma key system is you know you've got that terrible nightmare of showing up with a green or blue background and the talent shows up with the exact inappropriate wardrobe you know there's nothing worse than shooting blue sweaters on in front of blue chroma key well with reflect media it's a very simple matter to change our keys color all we have to do is if green is going to be inappropriate for the shoot is unplug the color-coded socket and insert the appropriate colors plug right into our dimmer pack and you can see I'm ready to go for that new wardrobe. I mentioned that you can white balance on an appropriate white surface that's made for digital video but a lot of cameras today can white balance on a digi gray or neutral gray surface. I've got two examples here I've got what we call our Kodak 18% gray card, and I've also got our Easy Balance. Um, what you'll notice is there is much, much greater level of flare and glare off the gray card than there is with the Easy Balance. It's because the Easy Balance is, was especially made for our video capture devices, and it, it can be, because it is so neutral, you can actually white balance off of it. The way we identify our last -to light reflectors is we put the uh, prefix LL and then the number, and in this case this is a 3628, so it's LL3628. The first thing you might notice about a last -to light reflector is the case it comes in. This is actually a, a Cordura, 2000 denier Cordura, which we started using instead of the ripstop nylons because when you're out in the field, you're throwing these into your truck, sometimes something can penetrate that ripstop nylon and actually damage your reflector. So we went to the heavier material. We've also put these little luggage tags on, which you can immediately tell you know, what's in there, right strap to the, uh, the hand strap. This last light reflector is kind of unique in the industry. It's called a tri-grip. And what's real interesting is when you open this up, you can see that instead of being a circle, it's a triangle. And by being a triangle, I can hold it with one hand. And as you can see, I can turn it to, through various axes. It does not droop like a circular one uh, will, will do every single time. The triangle keeps it stiff throughout the movement. So one person can hold this. It also means you can use simple things like super clamps and pony clamps to hold them rather than invest in expensive arms. This is what you're looking at. This surface color, what you're looking at, is something new we came out for the digital world. This is called digital soft silver, and it has stripes of our white and then stripes of our silver. And the objective of this is to dim down your spectral highlights, which, as you know, with DV and HD are, are very difficult to capture, and it really makes a big difference. Now, on the other side of this, we have what we call our soft gold. Well, what we've done is we use a little bit of a warm silver and then stripes of gold. And again, if you want to enhance skin tone, sometimes, believe it or not, on a bright, sunny blue day, blue sky, you can actually get a lot of blue into your skin tones. This kind of puts back and eliminates some of that blue. I want you to look at the stitching. This is called a box stitch 
and it's doubled. There are two rows of the box stitching. Um, but what that does is it helps keep your reflector surface very, very taut, so it makes it much more even. The other thing is, is that on all this banding throughout the Elastolite line, on all the reflectors, because of the stitching, because of the extra heavy duty material, uh, we give you a lifetime warranty. Another lovely thing about the Tri-Grip is how robust and wide this uh, actual handle is. It's very, very comfortable, it's padded, but you can get a good grip on it so you can control it. When you buy a last light piece of equipment, it's going to last and last and last. Akata's been renowned in what we call the uh, ENG world, electronic news gathering world. They've been making uh, camera cases for the very expensive large beta cam and now the big full size HD cameras. And uh, one of the things that makes them different and so appropriate for this type of equipment is that the padding inside a cotta bag um, will never absorb any moisture. Obviously, you do not want to put one of your new electronic uh, cameras into a sponge. So any of the padding you see in a cotta bag will never absorb moisture. Uh, the other thing about the cotta bags, you'll notice the yellow interior. The yellow interior is there as a convenience to the user so that if you happen to drop like a little cord in and you're kind of in a dark area, you can immediately see where that little accessory is. But the other thing which is real interesting and a lot of people don't realize, the very essence of this fabric is that it is anti-static for life. It's not a spray, it's actually the material itself. So with our electronic gear, there are two really bad hazards. Number one is moisture, number two is static electricity, and Kata from their inception has always designed the bags for uh, that protection aspect to keep your camera equipment safe. This particular bag, this is called an EXO7. Uh, it is f predominantly for your, your smaller cameras or smaller gear like uh, oh, VU meters, mixers, that type of thing, the miniaturization that we have today, you can accommodate that, those kind of accessories. What's also neat about the interiors, uh, in addition to being anti-static, they accept and take in all directions the Velcro inserts. And of course you can buy more of these at any time. Uh, and we have a, an insert section, which I'm going to show you in the bigger cases, that you can actually buy in rolls and uh, you can cut it off and make your own sizes, etc. This particular bag in the little X07 is wonderful because it opens up away from you, yet the zipper stops so that you cannot accidentally open up the bag and have your camera fall out. It re retains things for safety. Then additionally, you have underneath a separate compartment which you can again put your batteries, they happen to store the strap here when you first get them, but you can store your batteries, your chargers, anything that's hard, you know, go ahead and put that in the bottom. And it, it provides you with a real, real nice organization uh, of your uh, various accessories. The other thing you're going to notice in a lot of Kata construction is at various impact points, they have put this kind of what, this tuck and roll type of material. This is called TST. And as you can see from this little diagram, it's a sandwich. There's a flexible uh, material on the outside, a flexible material on the inside that has a lot of resistance to it, and in between is a sponge. And this is a molded, high-tech way to make a bag. And the reason they do that is this becomes like a shell to protect, to protect your equipment against impacts and being crushed. Another great feature with the X07 and the X11, which is its big brother, is this mil spec connector. They come with this, uh, these pouches, but if you don't need them, just take them off. 
And what's very interesting about it is when you put it back, it locks automatically, it snaps in place, and it's so strong that you could literally hold up your whole bag loaded with it. If you're looking for a great systems bag to take out into the field and you've got a lot of accessories plus your camera, etc., and you're looking for a roller bag, this is called the MC61T by Kata. The T stands for trolley because these now come with the trolley, the little roller device included. They slip in and out of a back slot here and uh, they're very, very con convenient because you can take the trolley out or put it in as you need because the unit does come with a shoulder strap and with the appropriate attachments you can use this as a shoulder bag or you can use it with the hand strap right here. The hand strap's kind of interesting. It's actually a clamshell construction so that you can open it and you see how that works. Very, very convenient. You're not always looking for your handles and your handles uh, fit very, very comfortably into your hand. This opens up. This is the top compartment here. And again, who remembers what this tuck and roll is? The TST sandwich, again, for shock resistance and uh, impact absorption. And inside, again, we have that beautiful yellow interior. Um, this is an example of the extra, uh, this comes with this unit, but you can buy this in rolls, this uh, dividers, uh, these dividers you can buy. You can see the various sandwiching, they, they have different uh, 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 densities. And what's so cool about this, it comes with these little Ys. Can you see the little valley? And what you do is you take the end of the valley, the bottom of the valley, and you match that up to the edge of the divider. Go ahead and attach the Velcro like this. This is called a T. If you can see that attachment, how the Velcro folds back. And then what you do is you take that, you hold back your T, and you place it in your case wherever you want, and those stick to the side of the case, just like that. Makes a very rugged uh, little divider, but it also makes it very versatile because you can change that position anytime you wish. This is the top area. Generally, people put their cameras in here. Uh, you can put a uh, camera map box. This dry pack is where you want to put things that are very sensitive to moisture. I like putting my batteries in here because uh, batteries are constantly, you know, they're, they're live whether they we're using them or not. And if there's moisture in the air, they kind of take uh, uh, corrosive elements out of the atmosphere. So I like to put them in my dry pack. The unit also comes with a rain cover. The material that, that all the kata bags are made out of is extremely water resistant. That's not the issue. But just as in a submarine, you don't put a zipper in a submarine. Well, the only vulnerable part to any bag is its zipper, even though we use a double seal. There's two lips here, and there's a lip in here. So when the zipper is closed, it brought, brings the two lips together. However, just in case you were in the Amazon rainforest or uh, in a Midwestern thunderstorm, we do give you a rain cover, and this rain cover will fit over the entire bag so it will even seal the zippers. If you've gotten your, your wet rain cover, you, the last thing you want to do is stick it back in the case with your camera because you're putting moisture back in there. So what they do is, you're, what you're supposed to do is you put this back and then you loop it onto your camera bag strap or whatever and let it dry out before you put it back in. So that's why we include that little mesh bag for you. Now, there's additional uh, access with the MC61. First of all, it's got the real hard protected shoulders. When you want to get your full access, lift up that outer shell, and now you can get access to the whole inner compartment, which shows you this extra divider back here. And you can drop in up to a 17-inch laptop and have it fully protected but take it with you in the field so you can do some on-the-spot editing. Another compartment that lets you have additional storage for, on the MC61T is this side compartment. You unzip the TST port and out comes these little storage bags. There's actually two of these and there's a port, of course, on each side. 
you can put in your cords, small microphones, batteries, chargers, whatever, and it keeps you organized. Some people have real long shot boom mics and they'll put the mic all the way down through the entire tunnel here and that by removing both of these. So that gives you a very safe but convenient and handy storage area for your long boom mic. And on the MC61, I'm still not finished with the compartments. Um, the next compartment I'm going to go to is this subterranean, I call it the subterranean garage. You open this up and now I've got more room under here for again things like batteries, chargers, uh, uh, VU meters, mixers, whatever you want you can store in there. But I'm still not done. There is one more compartment we still have not accessed in the MC61 and that is this one for personal gear. This you can put your pens, your keys, uh, you want to put a couple of tapes, whatever. Uh, some people stick a rolled up shooting script in here, whatever you want. But again, it's a, it's a very convenient uh, personal compartment. For those of you that are looking for a very slim bag for predominantly just the camera, we also make what we call the CC190 series. And actually we make about four of these, starting with a real small one all the way up to a real, real big one but the design is the same. They're very, very slender. Uh, they're designed to go over your shoulder or to be carried by the handle strap here. Uh, the point is this is for somebody that really does a lot of running <laughs> and going through doors. So we've made it very, very slim. It's also very quick to open the bag with this double safety of the clasp and the Velcro and the zipper and then voila, we are open. And again, you've got your uh, yellow interior. You've got, this is of course the camera strap, the, the camera strap, the shoulder strap that comes with it. And a safety strap inside. Again, more of the divider equipment, which can be customized. You do have uh, places on the side to put things and you can also expand or contract these dividers as the length of your camera requires. Inside is a hidden ID tag, which some people really like these days. And again, that just closes to zip closed the compartment. To zip close the compartment, we merely go like that. What's also fascinating, since you're shooting from above here, look what happens to this bag visually when the zipper is left open. Can you see the yellow? That is part of the design of all caught up bags, is if you've left a zipper open, the yellow peeks through and warns you you've got an open bag. You can stack your equipment and that really makes it convenient. Since we're on the back of this trolley, what I'd like to point out too, too, sometimes you have a real unbalanced load and it's going to get a little wobbly on you. So what these do is these wheels will pull out, increasing the length of that axle and so you have a much more stable uh, uh, roll when you, when you go around corners and whatnot. This is one of our many backpacks designed for the videographer. Um, you can see it has a very unique shape, which if you think of it is the lens part is going to be pointed up here, and then the camera body will conform to the, to the bottom of it. Again, you'll see in the shock areas we've put TST so that you're very, very protected. And we've stayed with the multiple port uh, uh, philosophy, just like in our other bags. We start off with, again, what I call the personal compartment, which is a big pouch area, very extensive, goes all the way down, and has a lot of padding on it, so you can, you can put uh, a very uh, delicate gear even there. It's got these loops, so you can strap on various equipment here. Um, and then the second compartment, second zipper, rather, opens up into the main compartment. And again, we have a way of putting your camera uh, either uh, top or bottom. I like to put mine bottom because I pull it out that way, but you, you do what, what you need to do for your configuration. We give you two mesh bags with this Velcro attachment. So if you've got favorite accessories that you're constantly going in and out of, batteries, uh, certain filters, whatever, you can keep that organized and yet it has a drawstring and you can locate these anywhere that's strategically uh, convenient for you. 
You'll notice we have a lot of extra padding down here, and this is kind of why I, I put the bottom of the camera down here, but some people want to put their lens down that direction, that's fine too. But these can come out and can configure to different applications where you may need more or less padding. We also have one more port, which is this port here, and depending again on your camera and how you like to, to lay things, you can use this compartment to store batteries, tapes, whatever that's very convenient in the top. And then you have full access to the whole bag uh, once, this is, once this divider is removed. And then you can zip that back up again. You have a handle here, and then you have pockets on the side. Now some people have put their tripods on the side. They'll put one or two legs in here, and this is fully adjustable, so it'll adjust for various thickness. Okay, good. You tell me why. This is the side gusset or side pocket on this on the HB 207. Um, it's adjustable here, so you can adjust the d diameter of the pocket for different sizes. A lot of people will put um, things like uh, tripods in here. They'll put water bottles, etc. Whatever you feel like. Um, there is also something that this bag comes with, uh, that the backpacks do come with now, and it's a little tripod carrier which can also go on the side or also go here because it attaches to these gussets. This is the actual tripod carrier and it has two straps that come above it. Those straps hook into these loops and then you can control the length of that depending on what your tripod is just by adjusting that. Now, the HB does stand for hiker's backpack. And yes, when you turn the bag around, there is a full, beautiful backpack harness here. You'll also see that these are contoured so that when you put these on your shoulder, it actually distributes the weight on your shoulder very, very, very evenly. And this has a full uh, waist belt so that uh, you can distribute the weight on your hips and your hip bone, which is the correct way to do it. The top being more of a stabilizing uh, harness rather than the weight-bearing harness. That's the proper way to set up a backpack. So this comes out, you leave that in the car or the trunk of the car, whatever, and then you only have the weight of the backpack itself. And again, you can see this is a real professional, uh, including uh, uh, back support adjustment harness that really makes it comfortable. It's designed for people that are going to live in this equipment for weeks at a time, such as videographers that document forest fires and that type of thing, or they're going to be in the Amazon jungle for a long time. That's what this bag's for. It is that comfortable and that ergonomic. This is the Kata Hexabag 3. Uh, it's our rolling light stand bag. Uh, it'll take uh, uh, six light stands in it. Um, this is our new length, which will take um, even the Avenger largest kit stands. Uh, the, the professional uh, A400 and A410s, which are used very commonly outdoors by the news crews to, to hold up uh, up to 5K lights. At any rate, it's a light stand bag. It can be carried with a hand strap. The, th that can be undone, and then there's a shoulder strap. And then the piece de resistance is that it comes already with the trolley already in it. So we can just grab a hold of your handle and, and roll it. The idea with this is that you don't roll it, lay it down in one location and keep running it back and forth to where you're setting up lights. The idea is you take it out, set up that light, roll it to the next location, set up that light, roll it to the next location, set it up that light, rather than running back and forth. Make it easy on yourself. Just tote this to the, to each lighting position rather than running back and forth. It makes your life a lot easier, you're a lot less tired. Now, to open the hexa bag, I start with the top. This is my top, and I just fold it back. There's a couple of safety straps, so you release the safety straps, just like that. And then it, what I do is I undo the side straps, and there's a big long, I've done, done the bottom one anyway, just for time here. There's some big Velcro. Um, this comes undone, that's your handle, okay? And you can undo this, and you can literally undo it totally and actually hang it up. But look what's inside here. I have six pockets, very large, ample pockets, that I can put your light stands in. 
and it really is a great way to haul your light stands around, um, especially if you have heavy ones because you don't want to put, sometimes you don't want to put the big heavy stands uh, in with your lights heads themselves because you can damage the light heads. So this keeps the heavy stands away from your lighting instruments, which is a real, real good technique. This is a tripod bag that is made for and comes with a lot of the Manfrotto fluid head tripods, but it's made by Kata. And you can see our friend TST is at the top here. This is what protects your fluid head. And what's very cool about this design is this top. Now you can unzip that one zipper and you can open up the top like that if you want. Um, you can see uh, it's fluted so that it holds the legs snugly down by the narrow part but up here there's extra room for your fluid head. This is the Manfrotto 503 head and it happens to be at this moment part of a combination which is one of our most popular combinations. It is truly made for uh, the DV HDV market. It fits all the cameras and is absolutely a perfect combination. We start with the head which is the 503. Um, the 503 has a very large hydraulic fluid uh, chamber. Um, the reason we've enlarged that over previous models is because uh, you folks out there that are into this, you are accessorizing your DV cameras extensively. And when you accessorize a DV camera, it's not just putting stuff on top, but you're putting weight farther and farther from the center of gravity. So therefore, the power of the hydraulics in the head has to, has to be increased. The other thing we've done is we've put in a counterbalance assist spring. So when you get to an extreme angle, you actually have a little assistance to the head coming back, if you notice, and going back to center. So it really does help you respond quicker and in a smoother manner to uh, changes in your talent's motion or your, your uh, scene panning. Whatever you wish to do, you're in more control. This you would order as a 503,351MVB2 kit. Also what we've incorporated again because of the various configurations as to accessorization, the quick release plate is not just a quick release plate, but you can actually slide it to various positions that will uh, give you a better balance. Once you find that position, you lock it down here. And what several of my guys do, my customers do, is they'll actually take some little white nail polish and they will put, if that's going to be their configuration that they're mostly going to use, they'll put a little index mark both on the plate and on the head itself and that way they can return exactly to that same position without having to rebalance. Then to release we have a, a great safety. You can release the slider lock okay, but that will not come off until you release and push in on the red uh, safety button. When you change dampening, in other words the, the tilt resistance to the camera movement, when you do that with this knob, you're not just making it a tighter or looser fit, you're actually changing hydraulic pressure within the hydraulic chamber. So you get that smoothness uh, throughout the range, it just becomes a little stiffer, but it's just as smooth as the lightest uh, setting because that, again, the hydraulics keep us nice and even. Now the 503 has its tilt lock located on the left side and the reason is your monitors, your, your, either your screens, your viewfinders usually are on the left side of the camera. So you can mount, which is a lovely thing, a lovely characteristic with the 503, you can mount your handle on either side but most prefer it on the right side so you can get into your camera, look at your screen and it's very, very comfortable. Um, there are configurations where if you want a studio monitor on top of your camera, we do give you another socket so you can add as an accessory two handles on your 503 and this lever here is your pan lock. Now another nice thing about this combination, the 503-351, we'll call it that for short, is with the 351 legs you have a 75 millimeter ball leveler and what that enables you to do is you don't have to take the time to level your legs perfectly, just get them down and locked and then I can use the ball here guided by the built-in bubble level that's in my, in my um, head and then just merely tighten 
and you're ready to go. Much, much faster setup time. This way, your, your pants, when you go from left to right, you're not going up the mountain or down the mountain. You are nice and level. This is the locking mechanism uh, handle on our leg set on the 351. It's a simple cam that goes uh, up and down, and you're, you're locked in an instant. And it's a very positive control. The cam's been specially designed to lock uh, at any position in the leg, so you don't have to worry about uh, presets. Okay, this is the second stage lock mechanism of the 351. And you unlock this lever, throw out the second stage, and that takes you to full height. Okay, this is the mid-level spreader, and what's really nice about it is it acts as a spreader, but it's off the ground. So if you've got an uneven surface, a rocky surface, whatever, it's never in your way. Uh, and when you're ready to wrap, you merely lock the, lock the spreader sections, pull it up, and it goes right back into the tripod, and you're ready to go. Another uh, addition that the 503 has over the 501 previous model is that this handle will telescope. And sometimes, depending on your accessorization, your configuration, this enables you a, uh, perhaps a better feel. Uh, it's more customizable. And uh, with the new remote triggers that go on these, uh, sometimes a little more distance is a, an advantage. This is the 519 head, which is the next model up from the 503. Our capacity is increased from the 16 pounds or so of the 503 to 22 pounds in the 519. One of the first features you'll notice is that the, there is a big knob here which adjusts the counter spring assist tension. And we can either turn it to the right to increase or to the left to decrease. And so you can customize the feel and the amount of assist you need depending on how you've configured your camera. Another thing we've done is on the front of this head, is we have a port and we can access this port if I can pop it off there we go we access the port and you can see there's a big screw head I unscrew that head I will pull the spring out and the spring as you can see is a bright yellow this screw is kind of an anodized yellow and you can replace it with the heavier duty blue spring and again you'll see how that fits uh, again you need the, the proper diameter and this is the stiffer one. Now, the springs have a range. This gets you from about, uh, the, the first spring gets you from about approximately three pounds to your 16 pound range, and then this gets you from 12 pounds to 22 pounds. So depending on your feel uh, uh, and the way you configure the, the head, you have your choice, of course, and believe me, if you want to put a two pound camera on with the 22 pound spring, that's totally at your discretion. We just have that choice for you. The other adjustability factor that we've included uh, with the 519 is this dial, which has uh, some detents. You can, you can hear the detents as I'm turning that. Now this dial is controlling the actual dampening, the fluid dampening in the head. Not the counter spring tension, but the fluid dampening itself. And you will feel that as you move this up and down and as you change your various settings here with this knob, you'll feel the dampening increase or decrease as you uh, turn this so that you can either you can, in fact you can take the hydraulic pressure totally out and it's only the counter spring that is actuating uh, the dampening mechanism so uh, you can control that yourself and balance and custom make the feel of it to what you specifically desire in that particular shoot. Sometimes the serrated teeth uh, cluster sometimes these get worn. So what we've done on the 519 is we give you an insert that on one side, which is the casting of the head itself, stays stationary. The other side, if it does get worn, they're easy to replace. You, this centerpiece is removable. That goes in, you rebuild it, and you're, you're all set, ready to go. If at any time you want to add a second handle, this cover pops off, bolts on, and then you, you attach a second handle, or you can change the position of the handle to the left side. Also, what, we, what you have on the 519, and just another feature, is this detent-loaded pan lock dampening control. What's really cool is, as I increase or decrease the amount of pan dampening, 
you can hear that those little clicks so you don't even have to be looking at the scale to know where you are. It's a really nice feature. One of the things that I recommend on good fluid heads, and it really doesn't matter the manufacturer, but just as a good general principle, um, you want to make sure that if your head's been sitting a while or you're in cold weather, uh, you haven't been shooting for a couple of weeks, it's really a good idea first thing in the morning before you start shooting is go ahead and pump your, your uh, pan and tilt axes. And a lot of people refer to this as priming. What you're doing is you're making sure that the hydraulics are uh, uh, evenly distributed. There's many chambers in a, in a hydraulic fluid head and you want to make sure that it's all well and, well and balanced so that your fluid head's going to perform with the smoothest dynamics throughout its movement range. So you want to make sure that you do this little pumping action uh, before you actually start shooting. And yet another feature set on the 519 is where we've located the pan and tilt locks. They are both on the left side of the head. The tilt lock is the upper one, the pan lock is the lower one. So it's very convenient. You can be shooting, you can lock off one, loosen the other. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. In other words, here I can do a pan, I lock the tilt so my elevation stays precisely the same. I can do just the opposite. I can lock the pan, loosen the tilt, and then my pan stays identical so I go straight up and down. Very, very convenient. Packaged with the 519 head is the 525 uh, uh, 75 millimeter ball two-stage tripod. What we've done here is we've made it a two-stage, which means two-section, so it will fold up to a very compact range. We've also given you these great convenient handles, which work in a horizontal mode so that if a strap or something gets caught, you're not going to release it with a vertical motion. This is a side motion. We've also designed it with kind of a taper, and we've actually experimented trying to hook a strap on here, and it kind of the strap will actually kind of loop off. So it's a good, safe, very solid mechanism with an extremely well-engineered cam to give you uh, secure locking throughout its working life. This is the top section. The bottom section is controlled by the same kind of locking mechanism to give you the full length when you need it. The 525 comes equipped with a floor le level spreader and you merely loosen these knobs. The, it slides out and you can accommodate any angle you wish. Another thing we've, we've incorporated into the 525 legs is a 75 millimeter ball leveler so that again you don't have to worry about precisely leveling your legs. Get them down and locked and then come up here, look at your ball level and tighten. And your bubble level then will tell you uh, whether, you, whether you are on the level for pan and all the axes at once. It's really, really handy. This is now the extended full length of the 525 uh, leg set. Um, you can see it's more than adequate uh, for your working height. Uh, remember that the base of the camera would be at this position and then we're going to come up even higher for the uh, level of viewfinder. For you guys that are t real nice and tall this is a very convenient height so you don't have to bend over to use the camera. It really helps save your back. This is the model 526, which is brand new to the Manfrotto video line. We now have a capacity of up to 35 pounds of camera configuration. This is a real breakthrough product. We've incorporated a kind of gear shift mechanism that allows you uh, your choice of three dampening settings from 0, 3, 2, and 1. And what that does is we're engaging different levels of hydraulic dampening. There's your number two. And you can see as I move this, it kind of shifts gears. And it's an amazing feel. Um, what's really cool about what we've designed here, we have kind of a gear shift mechanism that you can actually feel the gears change in the hydraulic dampening uh, control. And as you pump back and forth left to right here, this is the pan motion, you can actually feel the resistance change 
Uh, it's rather uncanny. It, it's almost alive. And then when you go to zero, you are taking the um, hydraulic pressure completely out. So you can also go to what we call a kind of a freewheeling set um, and then go right back into your uh, hydraulic pressure when you wish it. We have a gear shift also for the tilt and your tilt lock is again located on your left hand side. The tilt lock is up here, the pan lock is down below. So it's very, very ergonomic, very, very uh, well designed so that when you're actually working your camera all your controls are where your hands are. Uh, we have an adjustable counter spring here so we can uh, adjust this in any degree of tightness we want and you can custom set it in between settings. Again, so you can set the counter spring adjust extremely weak or strong depending on how you want it to interact with the hydraulic pressure. You have your locking uh, lever here that controls the lock of the position of the plate itself so I can put that into any intermediate position I want to balance my camera perfectly in the neutral and then to get the plate off, I unlock that, but even though this is loose, I can't get the plate off unless I push in on the safety red lever, and then I can pull my plate out. To return the plate, it is a simple matter of sliding it in. That automatically clicks into place, and immediately my safety is engaged, and it's a matter of me to slide the plate to the position I wish for balance, and then lock it off. Packaged with the 526 head is our brand new 528X tripod. Um, what this tripod allows you to do is it has a 100 millimeter ball, not a 75, a 100 millimeter ball socket, ball leveler we call it, and you go underneath here with your handle and you go ahead and level and then lock her down once, you've, once you obtain level position. Again, you don't have to worry about your legs being level. The 528XB is so robust that we actually recommend it to mount camera uh, jibs and booms arm, boom arms on. And you'll notice that this hinge is massive. And this is one of the areas where we gain a huge amount of strength through this chassis here. The 528XB uh, is also packaged with a mid-level spreader so that again when you're out in the field you've got uneven surfaces you're above the ground you can you can totally use it uninhibited no matter what the terrain to ensure when you use the 528 xb with a jib arm to ensure that it's always going to have positive lock no matter what the dynamic forces are when you're throwing your jib arm in different directions what we recommend is insert this pin and then lower the leg section onto it. And that way you know that no matter what happens, you are secure. The inventor of the fig rig is Mike Figgis, a very well-renowned uh, Academy Award winning director. And with the evolution of the DV and HDV cameras, he noticed that all the mounts that enabled you to hold the camera were either astronomically expensive or quite frankly they demanded you to do everything with one hand and when you do things with one hand it gets very fatiguing and also uh, you lose control you lose stability well he was sitting in a diner uh, at the day's end of shooting somewhere <laughs> and he noticed a waitress came out with a tray of plates okay and she was holding the tray of plates like this. And it was one of those famous Eureka moments. That's what we'll do. We'll control the camera with two hands. So what he designed then is he literally did take a steering wheel <laughs> and put the camera in the middle of the steering wheel. He punched out the, the struts and then rebuilt a strut in between. And then he noticed that he, he could hold the camera very nicely and do a lot of interesting movements and he also noticed he could then attach various controls and accessories. The only problem he had with his original automobile steering wheel was that the balance was wrong and he couldn't figure out how to correct that. He went to Manfrotto in Italy and said look I've got this idea I'm bringing it to you 
I think you can solve some of my problems and I think you would be the people that I'd like to uh, have this bring to market for me. And one of the reasons is if, if I allow Manfrotto to take forward that development process, you're not going to want to sell it for $2,000 just because it has my name on it. Um, you're going to design it for who I designed it for, and that was the young up-and-coming filmmaker. And sure enough, uh, the engineers at Manfrotto, they worked out the balance pro uh, problem by properly placing this uh, strut. Also, it's got a little cantilever to it. So that worked out the balance problem. We also incorporated a, a wonderful sliding plate that we took right off of our fluid heads. So that helps you balance the wheel as well, fig rig as well. And we even have a longer plate. So if you've really got a long, heavy load, you can have even more balanceability with that longer plate. But again, the main principle is I've got two hands. I am now incorporating the wrist, the elbows, the shoulders. Uh, as I walk, I've got my whole skeleton, my whole spine, my hips into the, into the action. And we're finding something else out, which is fascinating about using the fig rig. When you use your screen, you know, the pop-out screens that are on your camera, just like the microsurgeons, when they're looking at a screen and they're doing very delicate, small, precise operations, they get biofeedback, so the fact that they're dealing with something very small doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, dawn on them because they're getting this large image on the screen. Well, when you're using the screen that's on your camera, you're getting biofeedback also. And what kind of happens is after you use it for about 10 minutes, all of a sudden your movements get extremely smooth because subconsciously you are becoming your own little stabilizer as your body moves. It's taking advantage of the normal ergonomics of the human body. So without creating something that's really expensive uh, and bulky and heavy and complicated and that you have to you know, be trained on to use, the fig rig really gets you to enjoy camera movements that would take years uh, to accomplish otherwise. The other thing as I mentioned we can now equip the fig rig with our new controllers. We have a splitter box here that allows me to put perhaps focus on one side and my zoom controller on the other. I can also turn the power off and on the camera. I can also uh, stop record and start record on the camera without touching it. So this creates again some smooth operation for all your different applications. It's wonderful to do that. Um, in addition to the, to the splitters, uh, to the splitter box and the two controllers that, that you're seeing here, you, we have a new little clamp called a 595 CLA. This little clamp now enables you to be able to mount all kinds of things onto your fig rig through the use of this quarter 20 or 3 8 uh, uh, bushing adapter. We can put lights on here. We can put shock mounts for microphones. We can, we can put uh, mixer controllers, uh, extra batteries. You can put batteries down here and kind of, kind of adds to your stability. Another thing right now while I'm at this table, many videographers have used the fig rig in a, in a, in a very compact, tight situation in a small office. They'll put their subjects to the right or left of them and I can pan the camera just like this as I'm shooting the dialogue. So for some of the talking headshots and uh, office interviews type of thing, there's your rig right there. You're done. You're, you're, you're ready. You're shooting. Very short setup time and you don't have to take up a lot of room. Then in, in, and just to sum up on the fig rig, uh, it is a very ergonomic uh, device. It, it really takes advantage of all the natural ability of the human body to be a very good moving camera support. One of the things you'll notice is that on an Avenger C-Stand there are no set screws in our riser locks. The riser lock is the device that keeps your riser from falling down. You lock it in place. We don't have any set screws and set screws are problematic especially if you're vibrating down the road in a grip truck the set screws will actually start tearing into your riser and come loose. 
um, you either have to file it down, turn, the, turn your uh, riser lock to a different position, and then retighten them, or you have to replace the riser. So try to look for C-stands that don't have set screws in the riser lock. The other thing that we do at Avenger is one of the, uh, the real embarrassing things, one of the real troubles of arriving on a set uh, on location is you unpack your C-stands and a few of the T-handles have fallen out or lost and therefore you have a C-stand that's not going to hold up too much. Well, what we've done at Avenger is we've made sure that your T-handles in your riser locks are captive so that they will not fall out accidentally. So when you arrive on set, you've got a working C-stand. Uh, as far as tips to use, what I recommend, I'm going to just step over here a second, this is called a grip head and a grip arm. I've got them joined together here. A lot of people will take the grip head on the grip arm and put it on the C-stand. This is incorrect. The reason is, if you put then the head on the end, this could come loose and fall on someone. And not only the head itself, but whatever you had the head connected to can fall off. So what I recommend is take the, the head, the grip head, and mount it on the C-stand, just like I'm doing here. Then the grip arm goes into the grip head, just like this, okay? And that way, the solid head part, which is locked onto the, to the arm itself, this head will not come off on people. The other thing is, uh, as I'm turning you to the camera, when you tighten a grip head, you know, remember that righty tighty, lefty loosey. In other words, you want your load on the right side of the grip head. So the load itself will actually help in to tighten the grip head. If you put it the other way, the load tends to unscrew the grip head. So righty tighty, lefty loosey. What does that mean again? Put your load on the right side of the grip head so that it tightens the load as you're tightening it, okay? So uh, that's very, very important for safe, ap safe application. This adjustment here, which looks like a set screw on the Avenger C-stands, does never penetrate and touch the riser. This pushes a massive brake pad that's in behind it and brings and wraps the casting of the riser lock around the riser. Now that you've got your grip arm inserted into the grip head properly, I want to show you what is the proper placement of the grip arm relative to the legs of the C-stand. At this point, uh, my weight would not be over a leg or base area, base leg of my C-stand. So what I want to do is I want to rotate this around so that my grip head now, no matter where I tilt it, no matter how much weight I have, is going to be over a leg. So that you can, you can once you tighten it, you can uh, push down as much as you want, but you're supported by a leg. If you don't do that, that will then take the C-stand over. And of course, we don't want that to happen. So always put your grip arm over the leg of the C-stand. An important thing also to provide for is that on the opposite legs from your load, you should drop sandbags to make sure that the load will not tip over the sandbag in any way, shape, or form. I've got here one of our Stratosafe crank stands. A lot of people ask me, Mark, I'm going to be putting on a very, very heavy or long boom. What stand should I recommend? Aren't the little kit stands that come with my lighting kit good enough to put booms on? Well, quite frankly, they're rather dangerous if you do that. So we've come out with a line of crank stands, several, that can accommodate your large loads. One of the unique things about Avenger crank stands is most of the crank stands that you'll see around are manufactured with cables inside. What makes Avenger crank stands unique, and we, for that reason we call them strato-safe crank stands, is that there's no cables inside in the lifting mechanism. We use a rack and pinion, very strong, very secure lifting mechanism. 
This lever right here, we call the Avenger Dead Man Switch. It's designed so that if the operator ever is distracted, walks away, runs away from the device uh, with its load on, it will immediately automatically and securely lock into position. 